Uh, take your Bible, turn to uh, uh, John chapter 17, and um, let me get to my notes here where we are. Uh, let's see, we already dealt with that, and we already dealt with that, and we've already dealt with that. And where is it? There we go. No, already dealt with that too. Here we go. Um, and and turn, go ahead and turn to John 17 and then put a, put a little marker there. Uh, and we'll go back to it in just a minute. Uh, let's go to the Lord in prayer because I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to share something that's kind of been on my heart the last several days. And I don't know if the uh, if the young man that uh, called me last week uh, is listening tonight or will listen to this later. Um, I'm not what I'm going to say tonight. I'm not going to say you know in a bad spirit in any way, shape, or form. Um, but I've always been cautious about this ideology creeping into. Uh, our church because it's very, very dangerous. Um, some would say that it doesn't really have to do with Bible doctrine, so we shouldn't even talk about it. But I disagree. I totally disagree with that. And I'll explain what I'm talking about here in a minute. So John chapter 17, and then when you get there, turn to Romans 13, and we'll go to the Lord in prayer. I'm going to give you... Uh, what I have seen in the scriptures about um, man's governance over man. And I think, it, I think it's very, very important, especially in the days we're living in right now, where um, we, didn't, we didn't vote for the guy that's in office. Okay? And I'm saying us here, we didn't vote for that guy. And uh, does that mean that we... And it's been brought up by some people in this church that, you know, why, why are we serving him and so on. But let's, let's go to the Lord in prayer and let's see what the Bible says, all right? Heavenly Father, I love you and I thank you for this day. And Father, I just want to thank you, God, for the, the dad that you gave me, uh, the mom that you gave me, and just the family that I grew up in. And I thank you, God, for... Uh, his willingness to go out and work for his family, provide for his family, uh, to always be there with his family or wherever he was to provide for his family to be there with him. I thank you, Father, that his daddy instilled that in him and he instilled that in me. And Lord, I just, I'm, I'm just very thankful, Lord, for uh, the man that you gave me. Uh, to be over my, to be, uh, over me in my life and to show me, uh, godly manlyhood, Father, even though for a time, Lord, he wasn't very godly. But he was still my father and Lord, I was under his authority and I thank you for him, dear God, for the things that he showed me and the things, dear God, that we shared together. I'm thankful, dear God, for that last prayer that we prayed together. And I pray, dear God, Lord, that um, uh, that his life and his testimony uh, for you, Father, uh, would live long beyond uh, his life, which has already passed. Father, just bless those who have joined with us tonight. Bless your word. Lord, just give us understanding in these last days. Lord, there are perilous times that are coming. And Lord, Father, we need to be led and guided uh, by your Holy Spirit. And by your word, and there's just so many uh, people, Lord, that have gone away from the precepts that are in this book. And I pray, dear God, that you would bring us uh, closer and draw us closer to your word. And with your word, draw us closer to you. Bless us tonight as we study. We pray in Jesus' name. And all of God's people said, Amen. Had a young man called me on the phone uh, last week, he had been trying to call several days and um, what he had told one of the girls was that he had something that he really had to share with me 
and that um, it was going to change everything. It was going to change uh, our country. It was going to change uh, how Christianity is. It was just going to it was just going to change everything. Now, when he when I heard that he had said that, I'm thinking I don't think Christianity needs to be changed. Not not real Christianity. I think. The way the Bible is, is the way the Bible is. And I don't think it, I don't think it needs to be changed any. Amen. So, I, you know, coming back from camp the week before and, and so on, I was, I was just trying to get a lot of things done the first few days. And so I didn't have time to talk with him, but I finally did. And um, he started bringing up things to me that I knew where, what he was saying and where he was going with it. Um, he had fallen into, um, by way of watching a few videos on the internet, uh, and hearing a few people speak on the internet on this subject, he had fallen into what is referred to as a sovereign citizen. Now, some sovereign citizens don't like to be called sovereign citizens. They, they don't like the word citizen. Uh, because they think that they are not citizens of the United States of America. They're not citizens of, let's say, the state of Missouri. Uh, they think and are led to believe that our, our nation uh, was sold out somehow, some way, back around 100 years ago or so, something like that. I don't know all the history and I don't, I don't care to know um, that it was sold out and that everybody, they had this idea that everybody that's born in this country, when they write out your birth certificate and when they fill out your name in all capital letters, they use some obscure thing to say that only corporations are listed in all capital letters. So what they're saying is, by way of the government printing your name in all capital letters on your birth certificate, that means the government has made you into a private corporation and that um, they have, they use you for collateral against a debt that the United States owes, and that makes us bond slaves of the United States or a foreign government or something like that. Most of them believe that there is a trust account with our name on it that has billions of dollars in it, and if you fill out the right papers and send them in to the attorney general of the state of Missouri, and you send it in to uh, whoever is in charge of your county, and you send one in to the uh, uh, treasury of the United States, then that can give you access to all those billions of dollars that is your money. Even to the point, now this is, what, this is, this is how dangerous they are. They will look for a house that's for sale. They will move into that house. They'll take the for sale signs down. They will, uh, what is that called, squatters? They will, they will become squatters in that house and claim that it is their right and their territory and you can't take it away from them. And in some cases, it's very, very difficult to get them out of those houses. Uh, there are some that when uh, you, when, when um, that believe that if they have somebody do something like work on their car or something like that and they send them a bill, they believe that if they sign and endorse the bill and write some kind of writing on it to make it look like that that's a check, they can send the bill back into the person that sent them the bill as if it were a check. And they now believe that that debt has been paid and all the person who wrote the bill to them has to do is 
find the right people somewhere in a government office that has access to your billions of dollars and withdraw that money out of I'm not kidding you. I watched a whole court case where a guy believed that he was paying his rent that way. Every rent bill that he got, he endorsed it like a check. He sent it back to the company that he was renting this apartment from. And he said, basically, it's up to them to go get the money. I paid for it. And the judge was having none of it. Once judges and police officers figured out what all this was, and as soon as they start hearing certain things, boy, they, they know exactly who they're dealing with. And they don't, they don't take it lightly anymore. Because some of these people are dangerous. And uh, they have another thing that they do. Because the Constitution says that all Americans have a right to travel freely in this land from state to state. In other words, if we travel into Illinois, we can just drive across the river and we're in Illinois. We don't have to stop. We don't need to get a visa to enter Illinois. We don't have to get permission. Uh, we can't be rejected or anything like that. And we can go into Illinois, um, which is true. We have a right to travel freely in this country. So what they did was they quit saying that they're driving in their automobile. They are traveling, which then gives them the right to travel freely from one place to another. And the government cannot infringe on that right in any way by, by forcing them to get a driver's license, forcing them to get... Uh, tags or license on their car, forcing them to get uh, safety um, safety uh, tests on their car or emissions uh, tests on their car or anything like that. They don't believe that you have to have a, a license plate. You don't have to have a driver's license. You don't have to have insurance. You don't have to have anything like that. And that basically you can travel freely, which also means you can travel as fast or as slow as you want to go. And they believe then that when uh, the cops pull them over, they have this idea that a crime is defined as only if somebody is injured. So if I stole John's wallet, but I didn't injure him, then that's not a crime in their eyes. There must be an injured party in order for there to be a crime. So when they cops pull them over and start asking them, can I see your license? They start showing them all this paperwork. Oh, according to this, I don't have to have a license. I can travel. I'm, I'm a free man on the land. I'm just, I'm not driving. I'm traveling and all this stuff. And all, as soon as they say that, the cops get on there. Uh, can, can you send me about three or four squad cars? We got a constitutionalist here. We got a free man on the land or we got a uh, sovereign citizen on our hands. And they, and then they come over and usually how it ends up. Uh, these guys are actually trained, these sovereign citizens are trained in these videos that they only crack their window like this, this much, which basically means the cops are going to break that guy's window, grab him and drag him out, backside first, out of his car, throw him down on the ground, put him in handcuffs, put him in the back of a squad car. Now, this guy believes now that once he gets in front of the judge, the judge is going to turn him loose because, after all, he's, he's got a right to travel freely on the land. There has never, ever, ever been a case where a sovereign citizen has won by saying all these little magic words that they say that they can say, and that gets them out of every court case. They believe that we are, that in every court is under admiralty maritime law. In other words, the law of the seas. They believe that a courtroom is like a ship because it has a dock. And they believe that if they were to actually cross the bar to get inside, you know, where the lawyers are and the judge is, that that places them under the authority of the courts. So you will see these guys stand out in the where the people are sitting and they refuse to go in and deal with this case 
past the bar because they believe that that has put them under their authority. One of their key positions is, is that because they did not sign a contract giving the United States government or the state of Missouri or whoever legal authority over them, then they don't have authority over them. And they believe that since they are not a citizen of the United States, that they do not have to follow the laws of the United States. Now, let me give you an example right here in this room. Sister Mama Michael over there, okay? She is in this country legally, but she is not yet a citizen of the United States, okay? Does she have to follow the laws of the United States of America while she's in this country? And why does she have to follow the laws? Huh? Because she's here. The jurisdiction of this state ends where the lines are drawn on a map. The jurisdiction of the United States ends where the beach runs into the ocean. And a little bit far out into the sea, there's certain... A, there's certain jurisdiction out that way a little bit. But for the mere fact that she is sitting inside the United States, in the state of Missouri, that means that she must follow the laws of the state of Missouri, the county of Jefferson, the city of Festus. She must pay the taxes because she works. She must uh, abide by the laws. Um, she can't beat people over the head with a baseball bat. Uh, she can't steal money. Um, let's see here. Uh, she can't, I don't know, whatever, whatever it is that breaks the law. She can't do that and get away with it simply because she's not a citizen here. Now, when I go to Kenya, do I have to follow the laws? Of, oh, you better believe I'm going to follow the laws of Kenya. Last place I want to be is in a Kenya prison. Don't want to be there. So... But that's, that's what this guy was telling me. And they have all these, they use Black's Law Dictionary as like a law book. They say the definitions of words determines what the law means. And they play games with words. And I'm going to give you one. They say that when the cop pulls you over, you're not under his authority. But they'll try to get you secretly under their authority. They'll say... Now, sir, we caught you doing 55 and a 25, and it was in a school zone. So, I mean, that's a pretty big deal. Do you understand? A, a um, sovereign citizen, if he's thinking right, he will say, no, I do not understand. Because they've been told that the word understand means to stand under that man's authority. So if you say, I understand, then you have placed yourself voluntarily now under their authority and now they can do what they want to with you. The truth of it is, they are automatically under their authority. You know why? Number one, they were born here. Number two, they were in this spot going quicker than the speed limit allows this man caught them doing it. They are under the authority of that particular patrolman who has the right to pull them over. He has the right to detain them. He has the right to write them a ticket. He has a right to, if they cross a certain line, to put them under arrest and take them to jail. Now, Romans 13, and I've, I've gotten into it with uh, more than a couple people. On, on realms of biblical authority. And before I read this to you, let me ask you a question. When Jacob, um, when he went out to look for a wife, he found uh, Rachel, and he made an agreement to work for Laban 
for seven years. Who was in charge of, of Jacob? Jacob or Laban? Laban was in charge. When after he is married, he finds out it's Leah. And Laban pulled one over his eyes. When Jacob, who really loved Rachel, said, look, I'm willing to work another seven years. Laban says, fulfill a week, which is seven days, with, with Leah. Then I'll let you marry Rachel, and then you have to work for another seven years. So he did seven years. When, when Jacob and Laban came to an agreement about what cattle would be Jacob's and what cattle would be Laban's, when they got all done and Jacob... When he had fulfilled his contract and he left, was he legally allowed to leave? Yes, because he was under a contract. At the end of that contract, he was free and he left. And of course, Laban came running after him and he said, if I find any cattle that doesn't belong to you, I'm going to kill you because you'll be a thief. And Jacob said, you take, I guarantee you. I think what Jacob was supposed to get all the spotted and ring straked. And uh, so he had fulfilled his obligation and he was free from Laban's authority. Now, even though Laban did him wrong, Jacob put himself under Laban's authority again. And if Laban said, jump three feet in the air, what does Jacob got to do? Jump three feet in the air. Now, I'm going to give you another illustration. When Joseph had... His brethren and his father and his father's house moved down to the land of Goshen. Whose authority were they under? Pharaoh's authority. At what point did that change? When, when Pharaoh died and another Pharaoh came in, did, did, were they free now from Pharaoh's authority? No. And who is it that put... Israel under Pharaoh's authority. It was God who did that. Now we get to the Pharaoh of the ten plagues. And that Pharaoh is telling all of the midwives to kill the Hebrew children. Do the Hebrews still have to follow the laws of Pharaoh. When it, if it was a, if it was an Egyptian midwife, yes. When that Pharaoh decided to put Israel under slavery, was Pharaoh still in charge of the Jews, the Hebrews? Yes. When Moses, when God raised Moses up and he took him to the burning bush and talked to him there, he told Moses to go back with a message to Pharaoh. And that message was, let my people go. Which means... Allow them to go. That means that God recognized Pharaoh's authority over the Israelites. It was cruel authority, but it was authority nonetheless. And this is where, and I, I would say it's probably an American problem more so than it is anywhere else in the world. Because us Americans, we don't want anybody. We've lived 200 some odd years now in this country under a constitution. We don't want anybody telling us what to do. We don't want a foreign power ruling over us. We don't, we don't want anybody telling us we cannot have our guns. We don't want anybody telling us we cannot have our freedom of speech, freedom of preach. Amen? We don't want anybody telling us that. So... 
we're kind of gotten into this thing where no one rules over us except God. But if God puts you under someone's authority, you're under their authority. Okay? When Bill Clinton was president, we were under his authority. When Obama was president, we were under his authority. We would have been under Hillary's authority. We are now under Biden's authority. We don't like it. But he's the president. And rebellion is as what? So finally, after 10, and 10 is the number for dominion. After 10 plagues, Pharaoh released the Israelites. Now you can go. Leave. And now Israel was free to be put under God's authority. And God signified that by giving them how many commandments? Ten plagues, ten commandments. Now they are God's people. But if you read in the book of the first two, three chapters of the book of Judges, you'll see that God had the Israelites. They were there in the land. While they were serving God, God blessed them. But then they went a whoring after other gods. And because they did that, God withdrew his blessings from them. And then God put them under the Amorites or the Moabites or the Philistines. And sometimes they would be under there for seven years, sometimes 40 years, sometimes 20 years or whatever. But they would be under the rule of some foreign enemy nation. And when Israel finally cried out to the Lord, God never, God never told Israel, rebel, fight against them. No, God sent a savior to set them free. And what I'm telling you is, just because we don't like the authority that's over us, does not give us the right to rebel against that authority. Now, in uh, Romans chapter 13, verse 1, let every soul be subject unto the higher powers. Let me, let me stop and tell you a story about how, how bad this can get. Um, when I started doing the Watchman broadcast in 2009, uh, we instantly started getting a following from people. There was a man down in Texas who really, really, really loved uh, me. He loved the things that I talked about. He thought it was awesome. And he listened to everything I said. Um, he had been in trouble with the law before. Was living with his, uh, living with his elderly mom, taking care of her. Uh, he, he didn't have a wife, I don't think. I, I don't know if he was divorced or whatever, but he just, he didn't have a wife. He was not a young man. And um, I had heard from some people that knew him that he was sort of like one of these sovereign citizens. The police had a warrant for his arrest because... As a felon, he was not allowed to have firearms. He believed that he did not have, that he did not have to come under that court order. Even though he was a convicted felon and the terms of him being freed was he was not to have any firearms. He believed that he could still own firearms and he had a bunch of them. The police came out to his house where his, him and his mother lived and his mother had to watch this happen. When the police knocked on the door and they said, I can't remember the guy's name, come on out now, we got a warrant for your arrest. We're, let's just do this peacefully and calmly. He got into a shootout with them and they shot him dead right in front of his house, right in front of his mother. 
Some people I know who heard about the story, they wanted to blame the police. But the truth of it is, he was breaking the law. And he lost his life over it. So let every soul, and I've had people say, oh, that only, that only applies to uh, righteous higher powers. That's not what it says. Let every soul be subject unto the higher powers, for there is no power but of God. The powers that be are ordained of God. People have asked me, are you saying that God even uses evil authority? You bet I am. Those of you who read the Bible know that God raised up Pharaoh for a reason. God raised up Pharaoh and made him cruel authority for a reason, to show forth his mighty power. So yes, God even uses evil authority. Whosoever therefore resisteth the power, resisteth the ordinance of God. Let me ask you this. We're in John 17. We're, we're very close now to Jesus being arrested. Could Jesus have summoned angels to come and release him from being arrested? Yes. Could Jesus have summoned angels to come and take him down off of that cross? Yes. Why didn't he? His being subject to that arrest was fulfilling the plan of God for the redemption and salvation of mankind. Whosoever therefore resisteth the power resisteth the ordinance of God. And they that resist shall receive to themselves what? Damnation. For rulers are not a terror to good works, but to the evil. Let me ask you this. Did the Apostle Paul ever rebel against either Jewish authority or um, Roman authority? Now... When the Jews sought to arrest him and the Jews told the Roman soldiers, arrest that man. He's guilty of sedition and heresy. Paul then turned to the Roman soldiers and said, are you going to arrest me and turn me over to the Jews without a hearing from Caesar? I'm a Roman citizen. One of the one of the, um, the soldiers said, with a great sum have I purchased my citizenship under Rome. How is it you get to be a Roman citizen? And Paul said, my father was a Roman. So that meant that Paul was a Roman citizen by birth. Which meant that Paul had rights as a Roman citizen. And it means that he could not be arrested arbitrarily without having a trial before Caesar's court. You see, Paul didn't fight Caesar. He didn't fight the Sanhedrin. He didn't rebel. He didn't say, I'm an apostle of God. I only obey and serve God. If Paul would have rebelled against either one of those, he wouldn't have been obeying and serving God. In fact, Paul appealed to Roman law in order to have his day in court. And when they finally sentenced him to death, 
Did Paul call for an insurrection? Did Paul call for people to come and rescue him and start it and build an army and let's 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 get rid of the new world order under Caesar and let's take this over for God? Did he do any of that? No. Nothing. So verse 3 again, for rulers are not a terror to good works, but to the evil. Wilt thou then not be afraid of the power? Do that which is good, and thou shalt have praise of the same. For he is the, and I tell this to cops that I meet. First of all, I tell them, thank you for your service. And then I say, in some cases, I say, did you know that the Bible calls you a minister of God? And a lot of times they'll go, no. And I read them, Romans 13, 4. He is the minister of God to thee for good. But if thou do that which is evil, be afraid, for he beareth not the sword in vain. For he is the minister of God, a revenger to execute wrath upon him that doeth evil. Wherefore you must needs be subject not only for wrath, but also for conscience sake. For for this cause pay ye tribute also. Tribute is a tax. And by the way, um, sovereign citizens believe you don't have to pay taxes. And did you know that in every court case where they've tried that, they've lost? For they are God's ministers, attending continually upon this very thing. Render therefore to all their dues, tribute to whom tribute is due, custom to whom custom is, to whom custom, fear to whom fear, honor to whom honor. Um, owe no man anything but to love one another, for he that loveth another hath uh, fulfilled the law. Um, oh yeah, verse 4, I missed this. Uh, verse 4, for he is the minister of God to thee for good, but if thou do that which is evil, be afraid, for he beareth not the sword in vain. Every police officer in this country carries a firearm. And there are certain conditions upon which they are both legally allowed and in some cases legally obligated. To use that firearm and to use deadly force. Now, does ha, do all of them do that perfectly and right all the time? No. But that doesn't mean you take away a police officer's right to defend both himself and the general public with that firearm or with that sword. Um, in fact, I, I'm in favor of them having more powerful weapons than the gangsters do. That's what I'm in favor of. Now, again, I've, I've taught on this and people, some people don't like me for it. But you study out the Bible. God is never on the side of of rebellion rebellion is as the sin of witchcraft and I told that to this young man that called me last week I said you are practicing witchcraft you are in rebellion to man's authority and no you don't need to sign a contract or give the government permission to have authority over you you were born and because you were born, they automatically have authority over you. I'm glad they finally got rid of Kim Gardner. Amen? Amen! Now, there can be some justice in the city of St. Louis. Now there can be. There's no doubt in my mind that that woman was raised up to turn 
the streets of the city of St. Louis into an absolute chaos. No doubt in my mind about it. And uh, glad she's gone. Well, we can't get to John 17 now, but that's my spiel. And I, now, is there an exception? If the government is forcing you, mandating you to do something, is there an exception to what I just said? What is it? If man's law is forcing you to contradict God's law and break God's law, then it's different. Then you're like Peter and John. We ought to obey God rather than man. Peter and John were given a commandment by their Savior. Go ye in all the world and preach the gospel to every living creature. The Sanhedrin told them, if we hear you preaching again in, in Jesus' name, we're going to arrest you. And Peter and John said, we ought to obey God rather than man. In China, China has a one-child law. And if you, have, if you end up pregnant with another baby in China, you have to get a forced abortion now I don't recommend moving to China but if you happen to find yourself there then you ought to obey God rather than man now there will be consequences man will try to get you for it but I'm telling you, the rewards in your favor will be there. So it's a very simple thing. If man tries to force you to disobey something, something that is clearly, clearly against God's law. Okay? That's different. You obey God. But someone in power does not have to be a born-again, Bible-believing, King James-only Christian for you to obey that person. If a cop comes up behind you and turns their lights on, you don't keep going. You pull over. And if, if he is a vodka-drinking drunk every night when he gets home, if he's an adulterer, if he's a gambler, even if he's a crooked cop, he's got a badge, a shield, and a gun. And if, if you can prove now that you didn't break the law, you've got a right to go to court over it. And, and judges can't stand cops that abuse their authority. They don't like it. So, just kind of pray about that, all right?